Well, I, I think if there were just some kind of publication on a yearly basis of what the average, where the average rent dollar goes, and the city could easily do that. The city rent guidelines board actually does it, but it's buried in, in studies they do each year. Um, that's probably the, the better way to do it, to do it on average, because you do have these buildings that do have wide variations, especially if it's a mixed building where it's a co-op or condo, and then, you know, a rental with tenants who've been there 20 years versus tenants who've been there only two or three years, it's, it's just very hard to break that number up. Um, so I think a citywide average is, is, makes more sense. It could be that that's something that could be done by the rent guidelines? I believe so, yes. And they could publish that and start some sort of education campaign, if you will. Uh, to well, I think you heard that it was referred to by the Department of Finance. They get an income and expense statement every year for every building with 10 units or more. So they have those aggregate numbers already. Great. Um, and you, t you gave some numbers, which um, in 2000, what the numbers were, rent dollars going to taxes as compared to today. Uh, I'll ask this question in the negative, but I, it, are there any metrics available to identify what repairs are not being done because the money is not available by landlords or what development is not happening because the dollars are finite and some and the amount of it being used to pay the city on property taxes is um, more than it was 16 years ago? It's hard to say, but once again, it goes back to that big variation in the type of buildings in New York City. Mm -hmm. So if it, one of the things that, that the city has is any building that's six stories or higher is subject to local law 11, which requires a, an entire facade inspection, all four sides of the building, or every exposed side of the building, every five years. And there used to be a, a used to be able to either um, be deemed safe or you know safe with repairs being done or unsafe. Now it's either safe or unsafe. So. A, that inspection costs a lot of money. B, the repairs are usually in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this has siphoned off on the bigger buildings tremendous amounts of money just to comply with the facade inspection, which means that other things are suffering. Um, you know, the, the, someone referred, I think, earlier to the mayor's um, goal of reducing greenhouse gases by 80% by 2050. So by the, they outlawed number six oil last year by the, the, the easiest alternative, which is not a great one for the environment, is switching to number four oil. That costs you a few thousand dollars. The best alternative is going to natural gas. That could be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. My guess is there's a lot of buildings still, and we're actually seeing it, the city's actually mapped it out. Some of the better buildings in the city, like your district, the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side, are the last ones to be converting on some of these things. I know because, it. We have, because we, of the, the, we have very the, bad air quality. You know, right, and, and, it's, but it's, and also actually along the Grand Concourse is the other place. But it's, it's, you know, those are the kind of repairs people are putting off because they don't have the cash flow. And if there's one thing I've always preached, you know, uh, our prior mayor used to, Mayor Bloomberg used to like to say to owners, well, you know, look at the value of your building. Look how much your, 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 your building's worth now. That's because of me. Well. This is not a business based on value. It's a business based on cash flow. And that's and you need you need to have enough money coming in each month and then enough to go out for the necessary expenses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ritchie. I'm just reading through I missed your testimony, but I just read I summarized it, it, so and, I didn't uh, you summarized know. it, yeah. But, great. Um, Quite simply put, what is the effect of the real estate tax burden on property owners? And if you broke it down to it, it, dep it, it depends once again on the size of the building and the neighborhood it's in. But if you look over the last you know 15 or 16 years, it's been a dramatic effect because it's it's taken so much more of your rent dollar is now going to taxes than it used to. So for all the uh, number of the things I just enumerated about deferred maintenance. Uh, lack of investment, maybe other properties. If you're a professional owner, I mean, these are all the. That's the byproduct of, of of the city taking more money. And when the real estate taxes go up on a particular property, what does the landlord do with that increase? Um, if they can pass it on, they pass it on. Um, if they can't pass it on, it comes out of their pocket. And as I said, then they're not going to do. They'll fix the roof next year instead of replacing the roof. And when you have a city where buildings are 75 years on average old, that can be a problem over time. It doesn't manifest itself right away. 
How's it passed on when it can be? It's either passed on, well, the Rent Guidelines Board does a study each year called the Price Index of Operating Costs. So for rent regulated tenants, they factor that into their formula um, when they, they do rent increases. And if it's an unregulated tenant, then, then, um, then the owner's just gonna pass it on as much as the tenant can bear, what the market will bear. One of the anomalies right now that's going on because Mayor, Bloom, uh, Mayor de Blasio gave owners a zero rent increase last year, the tenants paying that increased cost where all the tenants in the city, and it's about 28% of all rent regulated tenants in the city have a preferential rent, which means they were paying less than the legal regulated rent. Those tenants and all the other unregulated tenants are seeing a much higher increase this year than they normally would have because, once again, within that class of tenants, regulated tenants, there's a zero rent increase. The landlord's going to pass it on to the tenant. Where he can. And in a borough like the Bronx, where I believe we are 81.5% renters compared to ownership, what does that mean? Um, the Bronx has a pretty high percentage of preferential rents. That means a lot of those preferential rent tenants are getting a, a bigger increase than they normally would have. The owner, when, when you have a preferential rent, when the lease comes up for renewal, you're allowed to go to the legal rent if you want. If that difference is hundreds of dollars, technically the owner could could increase all of that. I don't think there's a lot of tenants in the Bronx that could absorb that kind of increase, but the owner's gonna push that the envelope to cover his costs. So my questions and concerns that were brought up early on that in this, in our city, and in particular borough of the Bronx, which has the largest percentage of renters, we are paying more than our fair share because of the unfair tax class system I think you heard the gentleman from the Independent Budget Office validate what you just said. <laughs> but you agree with it? Yes, yes, of course. And simply put, a South Bronx resident in a rental building, which is the poorest congressional district and the highest rate of unemployment and the poorest of all of the boroughs, is subsidizing a home in a two-family home in Brooklyn, Parksville? I, I think what I heard him say was they have a higher effective tax rate than the person with the one family home. I don't know if he used the word subsidizing, but I do. I use the word subsidizing because that's in theory what it is. Someone's paying for it and we're being our class two properties. At the same question, when it comes to commercial stores, uh, whether it be a bodega, uh, that bodega owner is subsidizing a brownstone uh, or townhouse on the Upper East Side or West Side. Um, yeah, because I mean, the, um, it, it, buildings with commercial properties on the on the ground level have always subsidized the rent regulated tenants up above. So, so then it's just amazing to me. How come this is not public knowledge that we are not making this uh, statement for all to understand and see if I sum this up correctly? City charges landlord, landlord charges tenant, tenant pays landlord. Landlord pays city. Listen, we've been making that, that statement. I don't know who's been listening, but you know, I've been here 30 years doing this with RSA. So you know, we make that statement all the time, whether the press, the media want to pick up on it. Whether the, I mean, quite frankly, when you start talking property taxes, um, I think I have a decent grasp of it. But even my head was spinning at the, you know, when the Department of Finance was talking about some of this. So I think the average citizen has a very difficult time understanding this. And not to contradict what you just said, but according to the previous uh, person that testified, you have a statement that says, therefore, it should come no surprise that New York City had the second highest ETR among major U.S. cities in 2010. Only Detroit had a higher effective tax rate. That's correct. But that, that, was was a firm, that was done by the Furman Center at uh, NYU, a study they, they performed. It's a study. Uh, doesn't that contradict? with the previous uh, testimony where he said, no, no we don't no. have the highest. Uh, no, I, I, th I think he concurred with, with, he didn't use Detroit specifically, but I think he concurred with the fact that we have a fairly high effective tax rate. Do you think the city would benefit from a 2% um, real estate cap, such as the rest of the state? I think it would help, I think, but it's gotta be looked at in the totality of all these other caps and, and, and mechanisms to, to slow down uh, tax increases. Um, 
uh, I think you'd have to look at it in totality to see if it's going to exacerbate the problem somewhere else. All I'm not right. sure it will, but I think it needs to be looked at. And in your opinion, a unified system, more transparent, would be the way to go across the board? Certainly a simpler system would be the way to go across the board. Would you also class, take the condos and co-ops out of class two, if, we're gonna have, if we still have four classes, and put them into class ones as owners? No, I, what I suggested earlier was just two classes, a residential class versus a commercial class, uh, and, and with a fixed ratio between the two. I would not be in favor of taking the co-ops and condos out right now because then it's going to be, oh, it becomes more political. Why do you say more political? Because Assemblyman Bronstein will be fighting with Assemblyman Jonai over uh, who's paying their fair share uh, over time, and, and that, that plays <laughs> itself out on the city council. I mean, that's what happens every June at the city council. You know, uh, the people who represent large portions of co-ops and condos and rentals um, are debating against the people with single-family homeowner districts. So it would be no different under, under what you're saying. But wouldn't the right approach be on value or income? Um, yes. Regardless of the political hot potato? And that would also put the fair share on those particular pro properties regardless of class? It, it depends on how they're going to, what kind of, that's half the equation. The other half is the tax rate. So whatever the tax rate is, if you're going to look at the value of rental buildings because they are income producing, it, then you're going to have to see what the tax rate is so that it's still equitable across the board for the same renters that you were just talking about before. And my last question for you, the $22 billion that is collected in real estate taxes for the entire city, $22.5 billion, is that in compliance with the Constitution? Well, there was a study done a few months ago uh, by the former finance commissioner of the city of New York, uh, Martha Stark. It got some publicity. Um, she, she claims, and I've looked at the study and I happen to agree with her, that the, they are exceeding, the, uh, on, on the face of it, they are exceeding the constitutional limit because the city changed its practice uh, about six or seven years ago, I believe, of how they were calculating what the constitutional limit is. So I believe what they're doing now is they're, they're not counting uh, a whole segment of properties that have abatements in them because they claim it's uncollectible, when in reality it will be collectible. But her argument is that there's nothing in the state constitution that allows them to change the formula, which they did on their own. So should they, under should that they scenario- Should on the um, religious community and places like that that are that are tax exempt? Is that what, is that what they excluded? No, they, they, there's a large segment of properties in the city that receive um, abatements under uh, program code 420C. Right. They, they, and there's a whole list of them. Right. Interestingly, they didn't include 421A buildings, but they included every other tax abatement, you know, system in, in that, that the city administers, and they stopped using those in their calculation. But it was not religious institutions. Right. Mr. Please elaborate one more time so we have a better understanding on this article. The Constitution permits real estate taxes. Your understanding. Explain that. I, I think you should get the, the, I think you should invite the author of the study here to explain it. Um, because I'm not an expert in that area, but, but there is a study out there saying that they are exceeding their constitutional limit and what they're collecting now because of the way they've changed the formula of how they calculate the, the total take from properties in the city. And, if I, was to and I, I, don't want, I don't want to say the wrong thing, because it's, it's so detail-oriented. I don't want to you know, cross that line and, and mislead anyone here, which is why I'm kind of sidestepping it. I could see that. So, <laughs> but, but, but that would mean one thing to me, where the borough of the Bronx has the largest percentage of renters to begin with across the city. We have the poorest county in the state with the highest rate of unemployment, the poorest congressional district in the country, is now paying their unfair share of real estate taxes, and they're being over-assessed? Every taxpayer, every property taxpayer, what the study says is it's all properties in the city are being 
overtaxed that they've exceeded the limit. Not just class two rentals, right. not co-ops, it's everything across the board. But this is a triple whammy for Bronx sites, for example, where the utility companies are paying more than their fair share through this tax rate, which gets passed on to the customer, the consumer, here being the residents. The class two classification is allowing for an unfair tax burden to be placed on renters, which is being passed through the landlord onto tenants. And on top of that, now they are being overtaxed. I'd be more than happy to send you a copy of her study. I have it, but I, I am not going to, you know, ca uh, it's just not fair for me to, to editorialize on, on her study and how you want to interpret it. Well then, can I, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman, uh, just for the record, is there, I'd like to make a request for a formal hearing or fact-finding <laughs> hearing on this specific, uh, whether or not New York City is complying with the state's constitution on, real, on revenue generated by real estate. Uh, we'll certainly look into it. I don't know whether it comes under the umbrella of the Real Property Tax Committee or some other committee, but we will certainly entertain it and see where it falls. It might be something that the controller of the state of New York, who does analysis all the time on local spending, might be another resource to have him respond to the report from Martha Stark. I mean, that could be a place to do it, too. But we'll get into it because, um, you know, there are we have do have laws on the books to be followed. If this is correct, I would also imagine that every property owner out there would be within their right to challenge their assessment and tax rate. If, per se, the Constitution uh, it has not been adhered to and they have over-assessed. I, I would say that if it's turned out to be over-assessed, that why an owner would have to go through the process of challenging it, that the city should just make a blanket across the board um, refund to every owner who paid something, since every owner is affected, to make an owner go through a, a, a tax challenge for some people. First of all, they don't understand, a lot of people don't understand how to do it. And secondly, for larger buildings, it's quite costly. And it, it's, so I don't even see why it would be necessary, if that were the case, if that were found to be correct. More rebate checks, which the tenants will never benefit from. I, I, I can't speculate on how that far down the road. Thank you. Well, it gets more complicated as we go along. I must say that uh, many people in my communities who pay taxes don't realize that renters pay taxes. They're always saying, go after those renters to pay taxes. And it's like a continual education for the public to understand that in the rent are taxes, because who else is paying for it? So anyway, but I thank you very much for your you. participation. Look forward to engaging with you again on this topic. Thank Thanks. All right, we are um, going to ask um, Michael Slatter Slattery to uh, come up, if you would, um, from the Real Estate Board of New York, Rebney. Thank you. Why don't you reintroduce yourself um, so that... Sure. Uh, Michael Slattery, the Real Estate Board of New York, and we are a trade association representing residential and commercial property owners, brokers, managers, and other real estate professionals uh, in the city of New York. And we appreciate the opportunity to testify here today and are pleased to, with the thought that this could be the beginning of a real reform of the property tax system. Uh, let me, I, I will skip a lot of what's in my testimony that has been repeated by, talked about by other members, but let me try to make a few, highlight a few points and, and add a few points that not in the testimony that but occurs to me as we are talking about it today. Uh, the real property tax is an ad valorem tax. It's a tax which is based on the market value of the property being taxed. It's not a tax on the income the property generates or the financial ability of the property owner to pay the tax. In an ad valorem tax system, property valued at a million dollars, whether a residential rental or an office building, a single family house or a piece of vacant land should be assessed, should be assessed 
at a million dollars. How much it should pay is a different question, but if someone is getting a discount for that property, then we should treat that as a tax expenditure. We're giving them something that should be treated as a tax expenditure, and we should disclose that to the property owners. Uh, the, uh, the, the, let me put a little, a little few details on some of the things that were talked about, specifically the council's changing of the uh, ratios and class shares. Uh, from 1983 to 91, market values were, were not adjusted to, um, for class shares during the period of tremendous housing growth. And the city council at that period of time used its discretion to lower, consistently lower class one share of the levy. Uh, DOF says they, that saved them of roughly $240 million over a nine year period. And back in the 80s, that was real money. Uh, to, but just to put it a little into context, the class one share in 1985 was 13.4%. And by 1981, 1991, it had dropped to 10.9. Class four share at the start of 85 was 42.9% and increased to 52.98% by 91. Market value changes for those two classes in that period of time. Class one increased from 27% to 42% and class four market values were virtually unchanged. Uh, the, uh, also, but the, the other action that took place and this uh, after the, uh, the, the state legislature took away the discretionary authority from the city council, it established a system where class shares could not increase by more than 5% in any given year. Uh, so what happened then is the, there we go. Let me just, uh, my apologies. Uh, You know, so between 1993 and 2016, 24 years, at the request of the city, the legislature reduced the cap, that 5% cap, 16 times between, to between a, a cap of 2.2% 2, 2 to 2.75%. And in four years, that cap was zero. Uh, we had asked IBO to take a look at this issue uh, to try to highlight the impact of that. And according to the IBO in 2009, when the cap was re reduced to zero, the tax levy liability for class one was lowered by $660 million and class four was increased by $530 million. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Let me just also highlight, put a little, little flavor on the, the, the inequities in. 581 uh, and recite, uh, refer to a Furman, uh, Furman Center study that was done in 2012. Uh, the report identified 50 individual co-op apartments in 46 multi-unit buildings whose sales price was greater than the city's market value for the entire co-op building. And one striking example was in Manhattan in a co-op in a 13-unit building which sold for $50 million and the city's, the entire market value for the building, according to the city, was $15 million. Again, that highlights the impact of 581 on valuation. Uh, um, let, uh, let me uh, make a couple of other observations, uh, particularly regarding class four. And I know there was a lot of talk here about trying to get valuations right, uh, but I'm not sure that finance, despite its best efforts, it achieves that. Uh, you know, we went through a, the Great Recession in 2008 and 2009, and just by way of illustration, the market values of Class One properties uh, in 2007 was roughly 426. Um, I know there's a billion a million dollars. As of uh, 2015, it was at 415 billion dollars, which means that it really hasn't recovered from the recession that those prices are still be well below what the recession, during the recession. So the recession really had an impact on single family home prices. Class four properties, those are commercial properties, office buildings primarily, hotels, industrial properties and the like. In, in 2008, they were at $173, million, $173 billion. No year from 2008 to 2015 did the market value of those properties decline. It's, baffling to us how single-family homes can decline and commercial properties 
don't decline at all, regardless of the worst recession we've had in 50 years. And today, those properties now are worth 40% more than they were in 2008, before the recession. So we may be trying to get it right, but I think there are methodologies at times which skew the results, and I think we have to take a look at the overall assessment and see, is this really what's going on in the market? Because it is a formulaic system, so it's driven by a formula. And if the formula says this is the value, this is the value, well, someone has to step back and say, is this really the right thing? And, and the, I think the explanation I would offer for that is that in some ways the city was saved by you know, uh, federal monetary policy. So when monetary policy dropped interest rates to virtually zero, that basically lowered cap rates. But in 2009 and 2010, that didn't matter for real estate because properties weren't trading. But the lower cap rate resulted in being used to generate a net operating income or a value based upon the income the property had. So all of a sudden, a property looks like it's worth more because we've used a lower cap rate because of a stimulus mechanism that was being used by the federal government. Now, we, that should have been taken into account to adjust for that. So I think in one sense that needs to be reconciled uh, and addressed, and it can't just be formulaic all the time. And lastly, uh, we've heard, and, and the reason why I think the inequities matter is because the tax burden is killing us. You know, we keep hearing taxes are not going up, taxes are flat. Well, the, from 2000 to 2015, the tax levy went from 8.4 billion to 22.6 billion, a 170% increase. That's about a 10%, 11% average a year. So it's a little hard for homeowners and others to believe when uh, you know, elected officials say, we didn't raise taxes, when in fact their tax bill is going up every year. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I think, you know, when we talk about a rent freeze, when the rent doesn't go up, uh, but that's, you know, rent goes from 2001 year, it's 2000 the next year, it's not the same, you know, not the same no tax increase when your tax bill goes from 2500 to 3000 because of the changes as a result of assessment increases. Um, so I, I think the, the challenge for us is that the burden has become so great of late that the inequities have become so much more glaring, so much more painful, and so much more difficult to remedy. And lastly, the, as, as has been pointed out, both by finance and others, that you know, I think S7000, when you look at it from the beginning, was really a system that could have worked. You know, it had resets of the base value, it had discretionary adjustments, which I believe was intended to try to stop spikes in any particular class, but was used initially to try to shield single-family homeowners. And since after it was changed to give the discretion to put a cap on it that could only be changed state at the state legislation, that also continued to protect homeowners. So the challenge is that you know we are continuing. It's a system that could have worked but we continued to tinker with it to try to help and protect homeowners in a way that made the system worse. And we should have probably tried to find a better way to do that. But uh, hopefully, as this committee starts to look at this issue, uh, we will be able to come up with a system that is fair, uh, that will take place over time, uh, that will not drive people out of their homes, that will not drive businesses away. Because you know, for office buildings and others now, we're seeing taxes approaching 25 to 30 percent of gross income. That's almost confiscatory, that you're taking that kind of money off the top of your revenue. And that's what drives businesses away. That's what drives tenants away. We need a system that's fair, a burden that is reasonable, uh, and we need to you know, work on it together uh, and to make sure that we deal with all the complexities here. But it also needs to be a system that's transparent. And unless we start out with values that are real and open to all, that, you know, we're not going to have a transparent system. And if we want to make adjustments to that to deal with some of these issues that I just mentioned, then let's do that. But let's do it above board. And let's treat that as a tax expenditure because we know we're giving money back. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think what you're saying is it's getting worse. The inequities are getting worse yes. each year. And if nothing is done, it will be worse in two more years. Yes, yes. And, and okay. the, Nothing will correct it as what's there now? The, a couple of things are happening. Uh, one, what's happening on a residential side is one, these, are, these increases that you know, have been alluded to about 30 to 35% of gross revenue going to um, 
taxes are not just you know ma all market rate buildings. They're also occurring in buildings with 20% low income. So those 80-20 buildings are also being affected by that. And what we are beginning to see a little bit of is that the burden has become so great, particularly after properties are coming out of a tax exemption benefit, that we're seeing these properties being conveyed to those who are going to convert. So we are in some ways look, looking to lose some of those rental housing, which is kind of the lifeblood of the city of New York. So there will be responses to that. Uh, you know, some responses that have been alluded to with, let's have a tax break, let's give us you know, uh, some kind of benefit you know, if you're, to keep tenants here. Uh, but those grow out of the fact that the burdens are so great that we try to do things you know, on a, as a temporary fix to keep them here, and that's not the right way to do it. Any questions? All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank oh, you. Right, so you yeah. Dan, Dan does. Okay. You know, my, Mike, I just, uh, sure. you know, often we, I, you, you, we've seen it in the prior mayoral administrations, whether Giuliani or Bloomberg, mm -hmm. and uh, mm -hmm. that there, there's, you always see these uh, efforts by mayors to do, I'll call them one-shot deals with uh, maybe a large insurance company, a bank, to keep their property here rather than going to uh, Jersey City, which is now unfortunately for New York, flowing with lots of insurance companies or the hedge fund industry that's gone, migrated to Connecticut and, and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, is, is that sort of, ask a very obvious question, but uh, is, is the byproduct of that type of approach in mayor's one-shot deals on real estate abatements, is that endemic of the, uh, of the failures of our system?